yeah, today we're going to be going through um, solving some issues with um, the beasts in and out of Mixamo and specifically beasts with uh, motion capture data. So this is something uh, that happens quite often if you're using, um, you know, mocap data from Mixamo or you're using it from uh, Accurig or Actacore or whatever it's called or, or wherever else you get your kind of motion cap data from. Um, this is something I see quite a lot in terms of like um, both in my workflow personally, but also just in general with some of the renders that keep popping up from the community. So I thought it might be interesting to just do a, um, a quick tutorial on it. But fundamentally, it's about solving um, clipping issues with your beast. So um, to kind of illustrate this point, I've just downloaded or rather I uploaded uh, my beast into Mixamo, um, didn't change anything. Uh, went through the normal like Mixamo rigging process and then just put the resultant kind of FBXs um, with a couple of different animations on them back into Blender. So I've got two different example here, examples here. If I just play them, um, I've got, you know, one guy kind of boxing and I've got another guy uh, sort of waving over there. And in both of those instances, if I just leave these playing for a little bit, you can kind of see that there's a few issues. So. Uh, with the boxing guy, you can see the hands are kind of uh, clipping into the face. Like there's not enough space between the hands and the head. The head is a little bit kind of too low, which doesn't help this. And you'll see that the fingers are also um, a little bit like too tightly grasped. And then over here on the on the right hand side, you know, the guy waving, you'll see that as he waves, uh, both his arms um, and his hands kind of clip and move into his head. And this happens quite commonly um, with the beasts, um, whatever you're kind of doing really. Um, and it's something I've sort of faced a, a fair few times. But, you know, because all the motion capture data that is on Mixamo and, you know, Accurig or Ac um, uh, Actacore, Real Illusion, um, is um, data that's gained from, you know, people wearing motion capture suits for the most part or perhaps they're recorded through different like, uh, camera setups or whatever it might be. Because they're motion capturing, you know, with the proportions of a person, like a, a regular human, you know, five foot 10 or whatever, you know, average height, average build, long arms, long legs, skinny torso. When you then um, use that motion capture data on your beast, so on a, whilst it's similarly kind of bipedal in the sense of we've got, you know, two hands, two arms, two legs and a head, on the beasts and you know obviously we have that as as people um, because of the proportions of the beasts versus the proportions of a person um you know different things start to kind of intersect with each other so the beasts have relatively large feet um you know compared to people so you'll often see uh, kind of clipping issues with the feet into the floor and things like that the beasts have relatively short arms you know compared to people for the most part so you'll see um, some issues around the arms. And then obviously, most notably, probably, um, the beasts have uh, quite big heads, you know, quite wide heads, big soft kind of heads uh, for huge brains, as Void says in the chat. Um, so you'll quite commonly see, um, you know, your arms kind of moving through your head or your legs, like, you know, moving through your feet or whatever it might be, or your hands, you know, moving through the face and, uh, and, and things like that. So. It's not that anything has like gone wrong with the transfer of like the motion capture from, you know, the, the the raw data in Mixamo to your beast. It's just that the beast's heads are too big relative to their kind of tiny torsos, uh, relatively short arms and massive feet. Um, so you could by all means, you know, render out and use this and, and be fine with that if, if, if you're not comfortable doing the next steps, but you know, a couple of tweaks and a couple of simple fixes can really help um, just give everything the space. So give the arms the space they need, give the hands the space they need away from the head, you know, give the fingers the, 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 the correct space and, and, and things like that, give the feet its correct space uh, from the person. So the kind of techniques that I'm going to go through today, um, I'm going to use these two examples um, to sort of speak through them. But uh, in the end, you know, these techniques should be Sort of applicable to whatever you find yourself kind of stuck with or whatever motion capture data you you, you want to fix or 
or kind of whatever your scenario is, um, no matter the complexity also. Um, but I guess I've chosen some of the simple ones here just for the benefit of trying to get through the, the next sort of 50 minutes or so. So yeah, so we've got two different, um, two different sets of data um, and depending on how long it takes me to go through one, I might get to the second one, but we'll probably start with the wave first because that's potentially the simplest one to solve. And it's even maybe the most obvious. So I'm just going to hide. Um, I'm just going to hide the the boxing one for now. So over on the right hand side. I'm just going to enable some of the filters here. So if you um, can't see all the filters here on the right hand side for deselecting and selecting like different uh, different things, there's a couple of different options up here, and they all do uh, slightly different things. So I'm just going to move all of this boxing. Um, this boxing beast into its separate collection and then I'll hide that. So I'm just going to right click on the boxing um, armature. I'm going to select the hierarchy of it. I'm going to press M to move and I'm going to move it into a new collection and just call it boxing. So my boxing is in this new collection and then I'm just going to turn off that collection. So it just hides that. So we're just dealing with the guy that's waving right now. So what I've got here in my scene is the wave. So I'm just going to uh, increase the length of the animation here for a second. So over here, I'm just going to type in one or two. So I've got two windows open here on the bottom. Um, if you want to open a second, I think usually there's a window open at the bottom, but if you want to open a window um, and, and drag it down to the bottom, you can do that in the top left here with these little uh, crosshairs. You can just pick that corner and drag it down and it will create another window. So I've got two here just for the basis of um, setting up something that's easy to follow. So. In both of these windows, um, when you first set them up, they might not have what I have on my screen. They might be something like this, for example. And in any of the windows in Blender, you can change any window to be any other window. So up in the top left of any of these windows is this little uh, button here. And if you click into that, it will give you a bunch of options. And um, the, the two that we want to, to mess around with today are the um, timeline. Over here, so underneath animation, which is the second column, the timeline, the second one down. And um, if I just expand that, that will give you the timeline. So if I press spacebar, you know, I can play and pause that timeline. I can rewind using some of the buttons up here, and it will give you a, a essentially whatever the frame rate is of your given scene. So mine's currently set up to um, 24 frames a second, is it? I can't remember. Um, I think it's 24 frames a second at the moment. I can't quite remember. Um, so, you know, for every one second, there'll be 24 frames in that second. Uh, and at the moment, I've got it playing through to frame 192, which should be eight seconds from the memory. So we want the timeline on one of these. And then underneath here, we want another one in the animation tab. So I'll just click in the top left again. Underneath the animation tab, we want to come down to the very bottom one. Um, and it's called nonlinear animation. So the NLA editor, nonlinear animation editor, so the NLA editor. So if I start abbreviating things using the word NLA, all I mean is nonlinear animation editor. Um, it's just a bit of a mouthful to say that over and over. And that will also create a timeline. So you'll see that the two cursors are, are moving in sync here. They're kind of flavors of one another. So, you know, the timeline is an expression, expression of all the different keyframes that you can make over a given period of time. And so is the nonlinear animation editor or the NLA editor. So I've not done anything um, particularly, um, I've not done anything other than just drag these in from Mixamo. So what you see here is what you would get out of Mixamo. Um, so if I click on this rig, click on this armature, you'll see that within the normal timeline, I've got all these different layers of all the different um, bones. So, you know, the hand bones, you know, the neck and spine and hip bones and all that kind of stuff. I can collapse that if I want to just to, uh, remove some of these sort of the complexity of some of these keyframes I can collapse that again and so I've just got you know two uh, two two different rows of it so I've got my wave and I've got all the keyframes associated with it and you'll see that he waves once then he stops waving and then it waits for the entire length of the track and then he starts waving again when it gets back to zero and then and so on and so forth so the first thing we want to do is set this up so that it repeats the wave so you know after this point, it starts again, and then after the next point, it starts again. 
And the easiest way to do that really is to use the nonlinear animation editor. So use the NLA editor, which is the window down below. So if I click on this and make sure I have my armature selected and I come down and I um, expand the uh, wave um, or the waving sort of armature here, you'll see that it kind of has this orange block underneath. It's not like a full orange, but it's just sort of like semi-transparent orange. And you'll see it's named kind of something strange out of Mixamo, so armature.001, uh, you know, whatever that is, the straight kind of sided Mixamo.com and layer zero. So this is the name of the, the sort of data, I guess, that you get straight out of Mixamo. So we can rename that if we wanted to. So double clicking on this left hand side, we can rename that to anything we want. So we could think of this as our base kind of layer. So we could think of this as our base animation. So this is the thing that we're going to build on and layer up from. Um, all our fixes will be layered over the top of this. So once I rename that, rename that to base animation, the first thing I want to do here is I want to just make this into its own layer. So you can think of the nonlinear animation editor as essentially if anyone's used Photoshop or, or uh, really anything that uses a kind of layering system where one layer gets stacked on the one, um, you know, a layer can get stacked on the one below and so on and so forth. So, you know, you can create as many layers as you want above the base layer and each one will kind of stack uh, in order and cascade down and affect all the previous ones underneath those layers. So we want to be able to make our first kind of base layer here. So we'll just push this down. So that's this little obscure button over here. So if I highlight over this, this little gray button over here on the left hand side, you'll see it says push down action. So this will create, if I, if I pick this, if I pick that thing, this will create a new layer essentially. So it will create a, um, a new strip. So from here to here is a strip. Um, Blender calls them strips, I think. So this kind of highlighted orange bit, if I, if I click away from it, it goes, it goes kind of dark. So you know it's not selected. If I click uh, into that, you'll know it's selected. I can drag this around, um, this base animation. So if I wanted this animation to start later on, so maybe I wanted it to start you know, one second in, from the beginning of my scene, so on frame 24. If I play that through, nothing will happen, then he'll wave, and then he'll stop waving at the end of that orange segment. So all this has really done is taken all of those keyframes and collapsed them into this orange bar. Um, and we can get back those keyframes at any time by pressing tab whilst we have this orange bar selected. So if I press tab and select it, you'll see it goes green. If I press tab again, it will go orange. But if I keep it green, you'll see that none of those keyframes have disappeared. They're just nested into this thing here. So anytime you want to edit a layer, we have to tab into that layer. And then anytime we're not in that layer, we don't have to see all this mess of keyframes up here. So this is a great way of keeping uh, eventually what can become quite complex or a complex sequence of that, um, sort of keyframes or animation uh, or fixes onto an animation relatively stress-free in the sense that you can break down um, you can break down all your keyframes that you introduce into multiple layers that are each you know kind of a manageable bite-sized chunk if that makes sense so we don't need to mess around with that at the moment because we don't actually need to change uh, sorry if you hear the police in the background <laughs> but we don't need to actually change the uh, base animation at all in this instance so we're not going to mess around with tabbing in and out of that um, in, in this tutorial. So. Um, so we've got a base animation and the first thing we want to do is set it up to repeat. So one of the benefits of the nonlinear animation editor, so the NLA editor, is that you can do a whole bunch of stuff. So if I just move this panel up, let's just expand this on the right hand side out a little bit so there's a little bit more breathing room so hopefully everyone can, can see that on the screen. I'll try and make it as big as, as, big as sort of possible. There's a whole bunch of options here on the right hand side and they're in nested into three different um, buckets. I'm going to call them buckets or folders, I guess. You've got the active strip. So if you click into a strip, this will be the first one you see. And there's a bunch of useful uh, options in here. You can tell it when to start and stop. So essentially you can tell uh, Blender when that orange uh, box starts or stops. So, you know, if I move the end slider all the way up, you see that that uh, orange bar grows and shrinks depending on 
uh, the value I put in. And these are the, this is the frame. You know, this is the value of the frames in the scene. So this is the 77th frame. So our original animation, so this wave, was 77 frames long. And then it stops, right? So 1 to 77, and then it stops. And it'll all just get to this repeat to in order to get this to repeat, we want to come down to the second, um, or is it the third? No, it's definitely the second. Uh, the second kind of box or the folder here. So it's called the action clip. And here we can do a bunch of other things, uh, slightly different things. We can once again set the, um, the frame start and frame end if we want to. Um, but we can also set the playback scale and something called repeat underneath. So the playback scale is essentially um, how fast or slow the keyframes are over that time. So if I increase the scale to know, two, you'll see that he slows his wave down all the way to be 150 frames long or so in, in, uh, in this case. And whilst this isn't perfect, this is a really quick way of just slightly elongating the length of an animation that you download. So Blender will try its best to kind of interpolate, I think, the missing keyframes that happen here because you're essentially stretching time between the keyframes. So if there was one frame between one keyframe and the next, here you're asking it to do, you know, two frames between the first keyframe and the next keyframe. So I think Blender does a pretty good job of trying to interpolate the missing sort of data in a way between the two, but it's not perfect. So if you extend this, you know, really far, it can look a little bit jittery. Um, or it can look a bit kind of awkward, a bit stuttery, because there's just not enough information um, in the animation. But we won't mess around with that uh, for today. But for example, this is super useful if you, I don't know, you're making a little short clip for Instagram or whatever it might be, and you want to make it five seconds, but your animation is like four and a half or, or something like that. Then here you can just squeak it up and you can make it five seconds without there being much um, kind of visible impact. But the one we want for now is just the one underneath, which is repeat. So if I type one into this box, you'll see that I've got one segment of these orange things. If I type two, you'll see it doubles it up. If I type, you know, I mean, you can have gradations between these things, but let's just say I type in four, you'll see that it repeats the base animation four times. So if I play this over and let it kind of go through, you'll see that it, every time we get to the end of that 77th frame, it starts again. So this is great for things like walk cycles, and you'll notice this probably most likely with walk cycles or run cycles that you download from Mixamo, um, where they will give you the first 30, 40, 50 frames maybe. You know, he'll kind of run uh, you know, for a second in the spot. So here the NLA editor can be really handy because you don't need to have, you know, however many keyframes from zero to 500, for example, you can just have zero to 30 and then you repeat it. So any edits that you make to the walk cycle, you only need to make across the, the range of zero to 30 frames rather than the whole length of your scene, for example. So now we've got that repeating, we can start to begin to fix um, some of the collision um, some of the collision problems with this wave. So I'm just going to move uh, move these menus down a bit so we just see our character a little bit better. And the first thing we need to do really is identify what's wrong with um, the character at the moment. So if I just frame him up and put him in the center, you see right when we start and he's not moving at all, you'll see that his arms and his hands are sort of clipping into his um, or my character's kind of coat, as it were. Obviously, this will kind of change depending on what type of clothes your beast is wearing, like you know what sort of accessories it may or may not have, and and all of those kind of things. But in my case here, you can see that it's not too disastrous. I've got the arm kind of clipping into the body, but you don't quite notice it. And then you've got the hand and the thumb kind of clipping into the the, the jacket here. So we know that we need to fix that at this point. And then if I play through the animation and I pause it up here, we know we need to fix what's going on up here. So right about here, you can see the arms are clashing into the head and then the hands are clashing even further into the head. So at this point, vertically, when the hands are up high, we need to solve this. And then when they're back down on the side, 
we need to solve the collision kind of into the body there itself. So the easiest way to do this is essentially to add another layer on top of this base animation. So this is where the NLA editor is, is, is super handy because it means you can have a kind of slightly broken but base animation, and then you can layer up different fixes for different parts, different bones, um, or different parts of your beast at any one time. So you can break it down into as many layers as you you personally feel you need to solve the problem. Um, so again, like you don't have, you know, you don't have to solve it in the exact way or the exact amount of layers that I'm going to solve it in. Um, you know, I might only do it in one layer, whereas some people might prefer to do it in three or four or five, however many makes sense for you. But to add another layer over the top of this, um, you come down here. So above your base animation, if you just pick the no action um, slot, so this 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 slot above this base animation, and you just click here where it says no action. Over on the right hand side, it will give you a bunch of options. The first one being new in this box. The second one being extrapolation, the third one being blending, and then the, the fourth one being influence. So um, I'll try and explain these in, I guess, a way that kind of makes sense for me. Um, I don't know if they're like the exact definition of, of um, what they do, but extrapolation will mean that any keyframe you put in will be kind of held across the next length of keyframes in the scene. So you can have one keyframe and then it will be held across all of the next you know, remaining 77, in our case, keyframes. The second one called blending, there's a few different options in here. You'll tend to probably mostly use replace and combine. So replace, if I add a, um, a keyframe to a bone um, on this layer, but there's already a keyframe for that specific bone that I've just picked on the base layer, if I set it to replace, it will um, replace the previous uh, keyframe in the base layer. Whereas if I set it to combine, it will add our new keyframe onto the base layer. So this will probably become clearer in practice, um, hopefully. So the one we want to mess around with today is hold and combine. So we want to um, make sure our thing up here says hold and we want to say this combine and we won't mess around with the influence. Um, in general, you probably always end up putting the influence at one. And we just want to pick new here. So pick this gray box. And you see, once we hit new, it does exactly what happened the previous time we collapsed a layer on the NLA editor, where it adds in a new action. So this kind of um, mid gray or semi translucent uh, orange box at the top. And we've got this new action over on the left hand side that we can pick and um, we can name this whatever we want. So I'm gonna name this, um, for the sake of this, I'm gonna name this arm, arm and hand fix. So we've got that named, we've got it on hold and we've got it on combine. And now at this point, we wanna just address the collision problems at the beginning. So in order to do that, we're gonna have to start adding in a couple of keyframes to the armature. So um, we can pick our armature here. We can control tab to move into pose mode. You'll know you're in pose mode when it kind of highlights it, um, highlights the armature blue if you've still got it picked. And you'll know you're in pose mode when, um, when you pick some of these bones, they kind of go um, teal, for example, um, like highlighted teal. And we want to just fix um, some of these things. So. Here we, need to, here we know we need to make the arms kind of a little bit wider, so they need to just have a little bit more breathing room, and we need the hand and the thumb to not be kind of intersecting within the, um, the coat here. So in order to do that, I'm just going to come into a direct front view, so the, the Y on the front view, and I'm going to press R, and I'm going to start to rotate some of these bones. So in order to make this not clash down here, perhaps we want to just move the shoulder up a touch. So I'm going to click uh, the left shoulder here, I think it is, and I'm just going to press R and move that up a little bit and give it a little bit more breathing room. I'm going to do that exact same thing to the um, the upper arm and exact same thing to the lower arm. I'm just going to press R and rotate them around a little bit. And you'll see that I'm probably just about right without necessarily needing to move the hand. I'm just going to leave that as it is. So all we've done here is we've affected the rotation of these three joints. And we'll do it over on the left hand side. 
again. So those three joints, just give them a little bit of rotation so they're not quite as far out. Oh, sorry, not quite as far in, rather. Cool, so I fixed the pose. But I need to tell Blender that I fixed the pose. If I just press spacebar here, it will just collapse back to where it was before. So if I just undo that and go back, I need to just add in a keyframe for all the bones that I've just moved the position of. So if I shift click all of these, so these six bones here, so the two shoulders, the two upper arms and the two uh, lower arms, I just need to add a keyframe and I'll add that keyframe in on frame one, or no, frame zero rather. And I'm going to press K, add in a keyframe and I'm just going to keyframe only the rotation. So up here, the third one down, so I'm going to keyframe only the rotation. And you see that's added in, if we ignore all this, it's added in one keyframe on frame zero. So if I collapse this back down, so I've got, me, got my two layers here, I've got my base animation which repeats uh, four times, which might be a bit excessive, but repeats four times past the end of my, my the end of my sort of play bar length. And then I've got that one keyframe over here, which just fixes the position of the hands as they are in the down position. So as I've got this now, I'm going to collapse this down into a new layer. So I'm going to press that same button that we did. So the push down action button. Uh, in order to do this, actually, so the keyframes can't be on keyframe zero. They have to be on uh, one, I believe. So I'm just going to zoom in here and just going to drag them over to one. And then I'm going to push down that action. And you see that's made an, a second layer. So I've got my base animation. I've got my arm, hand, and fix um, layer. And you'll see that it has added in a layer. It's very, very small. If I zoom all the way in, you can see it's only one frame in length. But because of the original setting that we, that we picked, where we um, made this um, a hold, rather than um, whatever the other ones in the option for that first drop down are. That one keyframe, it will still hold that keyframe, despite the fact that the orange box isn't kind of moving over the rest of the timeline. But if you're a little bit like me and it's kind of easier to kind of visualize things in just layers and blocks of time, I might want to extend the length of this block outwards so that it just covers a little bit more of the timeline just for my own kind of like sake. So I'm going to go into the active strip and I'm just going to type in 192 towards in the end box and that will just make it the exact length of um, the, the play bar here or the, or the playback length here. So you can see I've got two layers here. I've got the base animation. I can make that 192 in length as well. So I've got the base animation. I've got the arm and hand fix. And at the moment, that just fixes the arms and hands down below. So they no longer really collide quite as uh, quite as badly at the bottom, but they still collide towards the top. So we're going to need to fix um, the keyframes up here as well. And we're going to need to fix, sorry, the position of the bones up here by adding in some keyframes. So it looks like if we just play through and scrub back through this, we'll need to tweak the positions of the shoulders. We'll need to tweak the positions of the um, the upper arm, the lower arm, and then also the hands as well um, to get this to work. And we'll need to fix them crucially at the very moment that they start to intersect. So we've got these two layers and it's important at this point um, that we are editing this second layer. So this arm and hand fix layer. So we're just gonna tab into that layer so that we're editing the keyframes of that layer and nothing else. And we're not adding keyframes um, outside of that layer as well. So the arm and hand fix, just make sure this is selected. I'm going to press tab and you'll know you're in it when it's green. Can't really miss it. And you'll see when we tab back in, um, when we tab back in, you'll see that the keyframe that we originally created is still there. It's not gone anywhere. It's still um, right at the beginning of, of frame one. And we're just going to tab back in and we're going to add some new keyframes to solve the rotation of the joints at this moment. So I'm just going to scrub through the timeline to the point at which they start to intersect. So probably around here where they intersect the most. 
So in my case, for this particular animation, that's on frame 19. And was still in pose mode, so I'm still in pose mode. I never, never left it. I'm going to add some, some new keyframes. So I'm just going to tweak the rotation of some of the shoulder blades first. So I'm just going to press R and rotate them down a little bit. So they're a little bit less kind of awkward and, and upwards facing. And I'm going to do the same over on the right hand side or the left hand side, depending on the beast's point of view. And um, if you wanted to do this symmetrically, you could turn this turn this on over here up in the top right hand side and just you know edit the bones in a symmetrical fashion. But uh, honestly, a little bit of asymmetry uh, doesn't hurt in some of these situations. Also, it just helps things feel a little bit more naturally. You know, no one moves exactly symmetrically, or at least I don't. Um, so I'm just going to move these uh, shoulder blades down a little bit, and I'm just going to move these upper arms a little bit out. Maybe just move these lower arms a little bit up. So I've now moved these six bones. So it's important to remember which bones you move, because if you don't keyframe any of the rotation of the bones that you've moved, once you press play, they'll reset, and then you'll have to remember which ones you edited again. So I also need to fix the hands at this point. So we're going to add in another two keyframes on another two bones. So the, the two hand bones, the left and the right hand bones. So press R, just going to rotate the hands so they're a little bit more natural. And again, up here. So I've now keyframed, just shift select all of these. I've keyframed all of these bones. And at this moment, so on frame 19, it's looking pretty good. Like there's no collisions from the front view. So I'm going to press K. I'm going to add in rotational keyframes to all of those bones. And you'll see that it's added in this, this uh, second dot over here on frame 19. And if I expanded that down, you'll see it's added in all of those keyframes on all of those different bones that I've selected. So the right hand, left hand, left shoulder, right arm, right shoulder, left arm. But we don't need to necessarily see those at the moment. Cool, so we fixed it up. Um, we fixed it at the high point. We fixed it at the low point for the most part. Although well, something weird's happening here. Not sure why. Potentially, I at this moment didn't keyframe all of the. Yeah, you see, this is a good example, maybe. So here, um, you'll see that as I scroll back, that the initial arm, or the, sorry, the left hand arm, uh, isn't looking so good. It's actually moving further through the body. So if I just click, click all these, or I click all of these bones, you'll see that um, over here on the right hand side, you'll see there's a whole bunch of keyframes for um, all of the ones that I needed to keyframe. And then over here on the left hand side, in my first set of keyframes, I missed keyframing the left shoulder by the looks of it, the left hand, and maybe even the right hand. Um, so I just need to correct that again. So I'm on frame one. I'm just going to rotate this, rotate the left shoulder, rotate this back out, rotate that back out. Just fix where I was initially. I'm going to pick all of those on the right hand side. I'm going to press K and I'm going to add in the rotational keyframe. So you'll see that it's now fixed that problem where we've got the arms. They're fixed at the big, fixed at the beginning of the pose. They're fixed at the top of the pose. And if I just let this play through, and if I let this play through um, to the end of the initial thing, you'll see that there's a few other issues that crop up. So whilst I fixed it at the beginning and I fixed it at the top, you'll see the fixes that I've made have made it coll collide into the body at the very end of the cycle. So all we need to do is use what we've created already and just make sure that we hold certain keyframes for certain lengths of time. So here, up top, I want to make sure that these keyframes, so this fix that I've made up here, continues for a length of time until he starts to move his hand downwards again. So somewhere around here where it starts to drop off. I just want to tell Blender 
to hold all of these keyframes that I've keyframed. Um, I'm going to press A to select all of them. Um, so all of these, I'm going to press Control C and I'm going to press Control V. And you'll see that Blender knows to hold between these two keyframes and that they're exactly the same keyframes between these two points. And you'll know they're exactly the same keyframes between those two points or those two periods in time because it puts this orange kind of bar, this sort of hold bar between them. So I've told Blender that the fix up at the top is valid for this sort of amount of time. And then as it drops down towards the bottom, I need to reintroduce the fix that I made right at the beginning, but at the end. So I'm going to copy and drag and copy the keyframes over here on the left hand side so that I've made right at the beginning. And I'm just going to copy them. And right where his hands are sort of uh, downwards again, I mean, you could do this right at the end of the thing, I guess, but sort of about here. I'm going to paste the original keyframes, the original fixes that I made from the beginning at the end. So if I press Ctrl V, you see that it um, copies the rotational data of all of these points at the end. So those, those fixes that I made at the beginning, so all those different kind of rotational keyframes for the different uh, bones. So I think it was these, these six bones. I've copied over from here all the way over here, and it's fixed the problem at the end. And again, you, I mean, you could cycle this towards the very end of the thing if you wanted, but for the purposes of this, this is sort of fine. So you can see that with only kind of um, four different keyframes, we've managed to fix the issues of collision both at the bottom and at the top. And if I control tab back out into pose mode and just pick the armature, all we've done to achieve that is create two layers I tab back out of this. I've got the base animation, and I've got the arm and hand fix. And then much like the base animation, um, where it repeats after 77 frames for however long it needs to repeat, I can do that same thing. So if I just make the timeline a little bit longer, um, I can change the arm and hand fix to repeat because it's now a, a block. So this block of orange here, I can I can um, decide to repeat that if I want to. So I'm just going to make it the exact same length as the base animation. So I'm just going to make this arm and hands fix 77 frames long. And then I'm just going to come down here to the action clip. Um, so underneath active strip, the action clip. And I'm just going to come down to the repeat box and I'm going to type in three, for example. And you'll see that the arm and hand fix now repeats at the exact motion of the, or in the exact uh, same kind of cycle as the base animation. Technically, you don't actually need to uh, to do this. If your strip is set up to hold, you don't actually need to repeat it. But I just personally visually find it easier to understand um, the different layers if I repeat them to the length of the layer that it refers to beneath. But maybe that's a personal decision. But the benefit of doing it in, in layers is, you know, I could have not done the arm and the hand in one layer. I could have done the arms only. So fix the arms, had that as a layer, and then fix the hands in a third layer if I wanted to. So let's say that um, I, I'm quite liking this, but I want to create another layer where for some reason he is uh, standing on one leg while waving. So here's where it starts to get interesting in the sense of you can start to combine uh, different poses relatively quickly and relatively easily without much um, in the way of, of, of difficulty. So let's say he wants to stand on one leg for some reason. I can create a third layer. So I'll come over here on the left hand side, pick the no action box, press, uh, press the, the new button over here, make sure I've got hold and I've got combine selected in these two boxes here. So in general, I find myself using these the most. Um, and then replace a little bit, but hold and combine and pick new. That will create this, this third action. And it's not yet a layer. We've not pushed it down using this button here. So it's not technically a layer at the moment. It's just an action that we're about to build into. And I'll just give this a name. So I'm going to call this uh, stand on one leg. Um, Cool. And then we're going to go into pose mode and we're going to stand him on one leg. 
So I'm going to control tab in while I have the armature selected. So control tab into pose mode. And then I'm just going to move, um, let's say he's going to stand on his right leg for some reason. Um, I'm going to move the left leg bones um, to make it into a pose. So make sure I'm on frame one for this. So you always want to um, just make sure you're at the beginning of the sequence of the animation that you're trying to do it on. Um, obviously, I'm on frame one here because my animation starts on frame one. But if your animation started on, I don't know, frame 54, you might want to start this on, on frame 54. But I'm just going to rotate these bones from a side view. So I'm going to press the, the little gimbal over here in the X view. Press R whilst I've got some of these bones selected. So I'm going to press R on the thigh bone. I'm going to move that up. I'm going to press R on the, um, is this the calf bone? Yeah, the calf bone. And move that down, move these up, move that down. But if I spin around, you can see that he's standing on one leg. And maybe I want to just, from a front view, maybe I just want to move these inwards a little bit. So they're a little bit less awkward. Maybe I want his foot to be a little bit pointed downwards so it's not so flat. So I've added in some rotation to these three bones. So again, I need to just remember to keyframe in rotation for those bones. So I'm just going to shift select all of those bones, press K for keyframe. Um, if you're in an older version of Blender, so if you're not in 4.0 or 4.1, I think it's um, the shortcut is I for keyframe or insert rather than K for keyframe. But in 4.0 and 4.1, it's they've moved it to uh, K as the hotkey. So K and then rotation. And you'll see it's added in that keyframe, that little orange uh, diamond over here on layer one. Um, we're on hold and combine, and we're just going to push down this uh, stand on one, one leg into its new layer. So now I've got three layers. I'm going to just increase the size of that orange bar so it's just a little bit easier to see. So yeah, here we go. I've got three layers. I've got my stand on one leg. I've got my arms and hands fixed, and I've got my base animation. If I tab back out of um, pose mode, control tab back out of pose mode, you see that if I play this along, he's waving and he's standing on one leg. And you'll see that the leg still moves. It doesn't kind of stay in an unnaturally fixed position because we've made these layers, um, we've set up these layers to combine the blending mode. So rather than replace, it's set to combine. Combine will kind of um, take into account the other keyframe movements of the layers below. So in this case, the base animation is the one that has the sort of movement for the legs. You can see over here on the non-edited side, you can see his kind of uh, thigh and, and uh, what's this called? Shin? Calf? Shin. Uh, his thigh and shin sort of bones wiggling around. Um, so you can see that those wiggles still happen. It's just that now those wiggles happen when he's standing on one foot. So in a weird way, it almost looks like he's trying to keep himself balanced. So this is the benefit of the nonlinear animation editor is you can keep stacking one layer on top of the other, one fix on the top of the other. And at any moment, you can turn off or delete or reverse any of these layers. So say I no longer want him to stand on one leg, I can just press this box over here on the left hand side, this little tick button, and it will remove that. So any edits that we're doing are non-destructive to the layer before. So it means it's really easy to try something out, decide whether or not you like it, decide that you don't like it, and then remove it. So you can you can pick on this, um, you know, you could you could hide it in this case over here on the left hand side, and I could hide the arm and hand fix. So if I hide that, you'll see that the hands clip through the face and at the bottom again. If I toggle it back on, you'll see that we've solved that problem. And if I toggle that on, you'll see he's standing on one leg. And you can keep going as many times as you want. So, you know, let's say that, um, I don't know what the next thing would do would be, but let's say I, I think he should lean back a little bit or I don't like the tilt of his head. Then I can come over here to the action editor again. I can press new whilst hold and combine are selected. Come over here, I've got this, neck, this uh, nice new action. I can name this something else. So like head, tilt, 
maybe spine tilt as well. So I've got this new layer. I'm going to control tab into pose mode. I'm going to make some edits on frame one. So I'm going to uh, pick the bones. So I'm going to press R and I'm going to rotate this back. Maybe I'll rotate some of his spine bones back as well. So just pick these, rotate these back for some reason. Um, I'm not saying that this is like a pose that anyone normal would, would, would make, but you never know. So I've made some edits to this bone uh, and the two spine bones. So I'm going to press K for keyframe and in the rotational keyframe. And then I'm going to push this down to a new layer, head tilt, spine tilt. And I'm just going to make it uh, visibly the same length as the, the rest of the layers. And you'll see now I have four layers. So I've got my stand on one leg, arm and hand fix, base animation and head tilt and spine tilt. So if I play this through, you'll see he's waving for some reason on one leg up towards the sky, up towards the heavens. Maybe he's being about to be beamed up um, for, from an alien spaceship, but who knows? Um, and if that was the case, maybe I want both his legs off the floor. So at any moment, I can decide to hide or delete any of these. So I could click any of these actions and I could press X and delete them if I wanted to. So I've never lost the original animation. I've never made any edits to this original set of keyframes. So that will always remain true. And then I've just got these layers over the top of it and everything is stacked. So at any moment, I can also go back into any of these layers. So let's say, let's say he's being beamed up into space and I want him floating off the floor. Um, now I want him to stand on, or I don't want him to stand on any leg, right? So in my stand on one leg layer, I could maybe change the name. I could call this float upwards. Make sure I've got that selected and press tab. And that will enable me to edit the keyframes of that specific, um, of that specific um, track. So I want to make sure I'm on frame one, which is where I added in the original keyframes on this uh, stand on one leg. And I just want to add some keyframes into these other two bones. So press R, rotate these legs. I don't know, maybe he's maybe he's something like that. He's floating around. He's like, you know, how did I? How am I being beamed up? So I've just added in a couple of keyframes to these two legs. I'm going to select both of them. Press key, key, uh, K for keyframe and add the rotation in. And you'll see it's added in the keyframes over there. And I can just, um, if I play through the animation, you'll see that now my, what was originally a one standing, um, one leg standing beast is now, he's now floating. He's still waving up. He's still um, like looking upwards also. And, you know, all of these are individual layers still. So again, on this float upwards layer, if I decided I no longer want him floating upwards, I can just hide that. If I decide I no want him looking upwards, I can hide that. And then if I decide I no longer want the fixes, I can hide that and I'm back to the original one. So this is a bit of a simple example, I guess. Um, I think someone, it's hard to keep track of the chat um, whilst going on, but I think someone was asking at one point whether Mixamo can can um, do this for you. And the answer is it can kind of. So in Mixamo, you can set, um, you can, um, I think you can set like the arm spacing, you can set how quickly um, different animations kind of um, move through. Um, which sometimes works quite well if your things are quite simple, if they're a bit more complex. So let's say dancing or um, jumping or like karate kicks or like all those kinds of, kinds of things that are a little bit more kind of um, body dynamic, then those settings may or may not work depending on um, the sort of complexity of the motion capture data you're, you're kind of going for. And in this way, you can solve the... The quick things quite easily you know once you're familiar you can solve the arm and hand fix quite easily 
and then you can tweak the animation to be whatever you need it to be from there on out. So one of the benefits here is that if you you really have this idea, you know, let's just use the aliens as an example, but let's say, you know, let's say I was gonna, um, you know, I was gonna add in a spaceship, whatever, you know, and it's gonna be it's gonna be beamed up, right? So I've got this idea for you know an alien scene and the aliens like fly in and all that kind of stuff, and you have your beast and you want your beast to be like suddenly floating in the air and like moving up and and you know thankful that he's been being beamed up to space or whatever, it's probably unlikely that you'll find something so specific in Mixamo. Maybe you can. There are a lot of weird motion capture data um, things knocking around, to be fair. But here, you know, you can just think about, okay, well, what's the base animation that I need to kind of make this work? So in, in my instance, maybe I just wanted him to wave to the aliens. Maybe I can then afterwards think about how I can make him sort of float upwards to the aliens and, and have those all as like separate different animation layers. So you start with, you kind of get 50% or 60 or 70% of the way there with a with an animation that you find in Mixamo. And then you just add these really simple sort of layered tweaks to things and get to something that feels a little bit more bespoke, maybe feels a little bit more, um, you know, feels like it's more complex than it possibly is. Um, so that's the benefit of doing this, is that once you're familiar with it, you can solve all the little niggly things that come in and out of Mixamo or whatever. You know, this could be also in ActorCore or um, AccuRig or whatever you want. You can apply the same logic to any rigs that you make that aren't Mixamo rigs. So if you're rigging things in Rigify or if you're rigging things in AutoRig Pro or if you're using the Mixamo rig um, plugin in Blender and things like that, you don't have to um, only edit the rotation of the bones, you can edit the rotation of the controllers for the bones. So this will work across any different rig type, across any different um, sort of motion capture data um, that you import from wherever you import it. And you can just continue to add and build complexity. You know, maybe I want one of his fists, you know, maybe I want his fists clenched at one point. So he's not waving, he's like yelling or something. Then I could add in another layer and I could clench his fists. And again, I have not, I've not lost or made any edits or deleted anything from the original animation. And everything is kind of neat and tidy um, in, in the order that makes sense for you, right? Like this might make sense for me, you know, this, this, this order, this stack here you know, your your brain might work slightly differently, so you might want to break it down in a slightly different way or um, combine things in a slightly different way or whatever it might be. Um, so yeah, I think we're coming up to the hour, uh, maybe 55 minutes or so. So if anyone's got any questions, then uh, drop them in the chat and I'll try and answer them. And if I can't answer them <laughs> like on the spot, then I'm going to jump into the... Um, into the uh, what's it called the lounge, sorry, and uh, jump into the lounge and just uh, we can troubleshoot a few things there. If if you'd rather ask your questions there, um, where it can be more of a back and forth rather than me just talking into <laughs> talking into the B stage by myself. Um, is there a way to face into the tweaks or layer in animation versus a pose? Yes. So this is another benefit. I mean. <laughs> there are lots of benefits to using the NLA editor. Um, one is that you can move these different blocks to happen at different times. So let's say, um, okay, let me just hide some of these. So I've got my arm and hand fixed. So I want that to just be the same. And let's say I want him to start floating upwards, maybe after three seconds. So I'm going to hide the head and tilt, the head tilt and the spine tilt. And I've got this float upwards box. So I'm going to move this set of keyframes or this block here, and I'm going to move it um, to around the 50 frame mark over here somewhere. And thank you guys for, for sort of joining and I'll be in the um, Beast Lounge if anyone wants to ask me anything else and maybe we can troubleshoot some things one-to-one. -one. 